This is Aurora with Supercharged Science, and today we are going to continue our talk about cells. So I just wanted to make sure you can hear me. Hi, everyone. Um, now, before I forget, uh, this in this class we're going to talk about cells, we're going to talk about microscopes, and we're going to talk about how to make a laser microscope. Microscope, And if after the class you like what you see and you want to take a deeper dive into some of the really most important topics taught in biology, uh, then you want to check out my website, which is www.superchargedscience.com slash biology. So superchargedscience.com slash biology. And there you'll find a complete course, complete homeschool curriculum just on biology. But for today, we're actually, I'm just going to show you some of the really cool experiments you can do just using stuff that's at home. So I just wanted to say hello everyone and welcome. We're going to be doing another class in biology. Now we talked a little bit last time about why cells were so small and I've actually got a demo here. This is a tube full of popcorn and I'm going to show you a really cool demonstration that you can totally blow your kids' minds. Um, before we actually get started, I do want to just let you know if you're really serious about giving your kids a great science education and you don't want to spend a fortune just spending uh, money on instruments and well gadgets are cool and all but you know after a while it's like oh man do I have to buy another piece of equipment um, so if you're interested and really serious about giving your kids just the best science education you can and you don't want to spend a fortune doing it and you don't need to be an expert yourself um, then I have a hands-on science program that's totally for you and we have a lot of free stuff that we give away as well so you want to go to my website which is www.superchargedscience.com and click on that free stuff button and just enter in your email and just tell me where to send the science experiments and I'd be happy to do that for you as well. Okay, so um, one of the, so if you have anyone you know would love to see this Facebook Live, just go ahead and just um, let them know right now. Go ahead and share the link. You can um, text it to you to them. You can click the little share button on the bottom of the screen that you probably see in Facebook right now. Let them know that we're about to do a really cool demonstration, uh, a couple of demonstrations in biology on cells. Um, and just tell them, hey, you don't want to miss this. It's only 10 minutes. Jump on. Go ahead and do that now if you'd like. To, if you know, if you think of somebody or two or three people, you're like, oh, they would love this. Um, then that you definitely want to invite them because during class, if you have a question, I try to answer those as well. So if you're coming up against something like, oh, you know, I, I don't understand why my kid says this or what does my kid really need here, um, I can answer those as well. Okay, so another reason that you totally, I'll give you a minute to do that. Another reason that you want to invite people and you want to be on this class right now is because A, no one is teaching science like this. And in a way that gives your kids their natural ability and to have the confidence inside and, and builds up their self-esteem and builds up their curiosity and, and the way of thinking like a real scientist does in today's world. And also, definitely, without question, I'm going to show you three things. I'm going to show you how to excite your kid and ignite their interest in science long term so they will have a lifetime love of learning. I'm also going to show the, um, you how to build unbelievable science projects just using household stuff. And the third thing we're going to do is that they're going to make projects that are going to amaze themselves. It's going to be just amazing and just mind-blowing to them. Um, the other thing, the, uh, the third thing we're going to do is they are going to get skilled at using the resources that are already around them. And that's actually a skill that gets glossed over a lot. You know, you can just, you know, with the internet today, you can just quickly buy something on Amazon or you could buy something here, but what about using the things that are already available? And by looking at things in a new and maybe a way you haven't thought before. So that's what we're going to do today. So I want you to understand this class is just for homeschoolers. Homeschoolers are people looking for enrichment for their child who really place a high value of science um, education and they know that this is really important for the world that we live in. So, all right, you guys ready to get started? Okay, so what does popcorn have to do with cells? <laughs> well, <laughs> there are cells in the popcorn, but you can't see them. Cells are really, really small. Building blocks of everything. In fact, I have an official slide. Let me find it for you. An official slide here. I have not yet figured out how to put these on my screen, how to share my screen, so I print them out and they're mirrored, so I actually can't read this. But you can. So what does it say? Cell is the smallest unit of life that can replicate independently. So that's a textbook definition of what a cell is. Basically, what kids need to know about cells is really small. And they're really small because that's the size they need to be, do their job. So last time we talked about painting the blocks, like if you had a, like a stack of tiny little blocks and you stacked them all up and you were painting them. 
you would use a lot more paint if you painted each individual block and then stacked it versus if you just were to swipe the whole thing with paint, right? You'd use less paint because there's some surfaces that you would never actually get paint on them. So cells are small for a reason because we want as much paint area, as much surface area to interact and do all the chemistry that it needs to do um, in order for cells to do their job. The other thing I want to show you is something, the difference between surface area and volume. Because you don't want cells so small where you can't fit what you need to inside them, but you want them large enough so it fits all their good stuff. And then you also need as much surface area, as much area as you could paint and touch so they can interact, chemically interact. You wouldn't want this giant, one giant big cell walking down the street, right? <laughs> it would take all day, tons of energy, um, and it would, uh, it would take forever for stuff to get in and out. So cells are small, they're quick, they're efficient, and they're really good at what they do. Let me show you the difference between surface area and volume. So I have a tube here, and you can totally do this at home. You don't need this fancy clear paper. These, were, these are transparencies. Anybody remember these? <laughs> from like 1982. <laughs> I used to teach on these because I'm so small. I'm actually only five feet tall and I don't reach a lot of blackboards. You know, I've, I'm, I'm like at the bottom third. And so when I was teaching at the university, I solved that problem by using transparencies like crazy. So I have boxes and boxes of these because nobody uses them anymore. Um, so I have some transparent. You can just use a sheet of paper. And what I've done is, here's my sheet of paper, is I've rolled it this way and I've taped it. And that's what this is. Okay, so I've rolled it long ways and taped it, and then I've filled this one with popcorn. Then I've taken another sheet, and I've rolled it the other way, and I've taped it. So one is long and skinny, and one is kind of short and fat, and I have the short, fat guy here. So the question is, which one actually will hold, well, do they hold the same? I mean, it's the same sheet of paper, right? They should hold the same. What do you guys think, yes, no, maybe? Go ahead and type it in, what do you think? What do you think, should they hold the same? Let's find out. So I'm gonna place this one here, and all I'm gonna do, and hopefully do it without spilling, is I'm gonna lift this one off, and it holds the same. The level of popcorn should be here. Okay, so here we go. So the tall and skinny guy, let's see if I can get it started here. Come on, there we go. Whoa, check that out, what happened? We have space. Why do we have space? What does that mean if this was a cell? If this was a cell and this was a cell, which one could you get more stuff into? Yeah, that one, right? So you could continue this experiment and you would go, you could get shorter and fat. It doesn't seem weird that the shorter and fatter one can hold more, right? Because this thing was up to the top, huh? Wow. So they have the same surface area, right? It's one sheet of paper, um, but they hold different amounts because of the geometry of the thing. And so you could play with this. You could take the same eight and a half by 11 and, and make it a different, um, different uh, shape to keep the surface area the same. And you'd find that you'd get, you could fit more and more. So the more short and fat you get, the more and more you can actually hold until the thing looks like a sphere and that's the most efficient. Um, but you'll find that cells are not spherical. They actually are kind of like a squashed cylinder because that's the perfect amount of surface area that they need. Actually, circles don't have enough surface area um, for them to do their job. So that's something I wanted to show you that's really super easy, really fun to do. And now we're gonna move on to how do you see cells? Let me raise the camera a little bit so you can see a little bit better. So hang on just a second. Let me raise it just a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so hi, uh, geometry is, I know, science and geometry. You know, a lot of people um, get a little nervous when we start talking about math and they're like, oh my gosh, my kid doesn't know enough math to do science. Um, here's the good news, <laughs> take a breath. <laughs> math is the language of science. And so what that means is you can learn math along with science so you know what it's for. Um, so that's actually one of the, uh, the primary fundamental principles in my online program, kids, don't have any math background usually. And by the time they're done, they're already performing trigonometry, geometry, and calculus because they know what to use it for and it makes sense. So, if you wanna see a cell, what do you need to do? What do you think? Yeah, you need like a pair of something, a, a microscope, right? Microscopes will help you see cells, right? If you have one of these. They're really big, they're really fancy. When you get high school, you need one. But if you've got a third grader who's really excited about cells and you don't want to spend 300 bucks on one of those, what do you do? Well, if you have a pair of binoculars, turn them backwards and look through them. 
that's, uh, that's, a, that's a compound microscope right there. Um, another way you can do it is you get two handheld magnifiers. Oh, you know what? I had promised to show you that. Let me see if I've got my magnifiers here. Let me see really quick. Disappear from view. I just happen to have dun -da -da -da, no magnifiers. Look at that. Wait, maybe I've got one. Nope, I've just got the hologram experiment. Okay, well, so you take two hand, here, here are my two hand old magnifiers, and you put one, and then you put another, and you stack them, and you look through both of them, and then you change this, the distance between the two magnifiers, until they come into focus. And that's all a handheld, that's all a compound microscope is. And so if you want to find out what magnification it is, like on mine, we've got, let me find one that's not actually plugged in. So on a microscope, you've got two lenses. So you've got the top lens and the bottom lens. So if this one is 10x, if it magnifies 10 times what you would normally see, and this one's 4x, 10 times 4 is 40, right? So this would be a 40x configuration. So when you do that trick with the two handheld mag uh, magnifiers, you just look at what the magnification is and multiply them together. So that's an easy way to do, um, to make yourself a, <laughs> microscope, a, hand, a compound microscope at home. I'm going to show you how to make a laser microscope, but first I want to show you a couple of the really cool microscopes that are out there today that you might be interested in knowing. So number one is we have an optical microscope. Let me move this. All right. So the first one is an optical microscope. Can you see that okay? Type something in the box, whoops, and let me know that you can see it. Can you see that okay? Does that look right? Right to you? Okay. So optical microscopes, they use light and lenses to magnify, um, uh, to magnify the image. Have you ever played with like a pitcher of water, right? It's like distorts the image, right? And it magnifies things. It's the same thing. This is, this is just like the lens that you would find on a magnifier. You can kind of run your fingers gently over it and there's a bump in the middle, just like a bump on this water pitcher. It uses it to bend and stretch the light waves. So, opti so you, you've got optical microscopes, okay? And we're really familiar with those, the ones I just showed you, that's an optical microscope. But there are other microscopes, too, that are really cool. I'm going to show you a video from one, too. Okay, so this one, you can see that one okay? This one's called a multi-photon excitation microscope. And these guys use lasers. Um, they will make high-resolution images like and by using a titanium sapphire laser. And you'll see different colors here because they've used a colored protein so they can observe it. And this is actually, this one right here is a mouse intestine. And if you see like the red, that's the actin and the green is the nuclei and stuff like that. So, so this is the, the sapphire laser I was talking about right there that took this image. Isn't that cool? So you're going to make your own laser microscope. It's going to be a little bit different than this one, but you will be able to see stuff. Okay, and then the next one. Okay, now you've probably heard of the electron microscope because when these were discovered, oh my gosh, everybody was super excited. And I'll tell you the problems with these two. Um, okay, so when you talk about a electron microscope, an electron microscope, you could be talking about a couple of different kinds. Um, the electron microscope, let's see if I can point at the same time. Um, here's the optical microscope and it's got lenses and the light gets um, spread out and put back together and distorted so you can get the, um, you can see the image. Um, a, you've got two different kinds here. It, electron microscope in general uses magnets and uh, to move and focus the electrons um, and instead of just using light to see the image. So TEM, that's this one here. Okay, so that stands for transmission electron microscope and it uses really high magnification and it gets like 2D views of things. This one, this picture here is an optical microscope. And then the other one, the scanning electron microscope, the SEM, this guy here, this one will create the 3D black and white images, and those images appear on the computer screen. Now the problem with electron microscopes is the thing you're looking at has to be dead because of the metal that they put inside, and so you can't view anything live, which is unfortunate, but sometimes it's like, hey, it's the best we can do, right? But then, recently, Scientists figured out this really cool, and I'm going to show you a video of it too, really cool fluorescent microscope. And what that does, it's, it's a fluorescent optical microscope. It allows you to see things that you're looking at alive, and you can also stain things. So you can see which parts are which, 
whether the organism is alive or dead. So let me show you a video. You can just hook up a camera to it too. I might have to turn off the lights to make this work. Um, I have a video of it, which maybe I can get to work. See if you can see this without too much of a glare. Can you see that? So those are blood cells, okay? And now you're looking at a zebra baby fish, baby zebra fish that is growing, okay? And this is a fruit fly that's developing. Oh wait, or is this one the zebra? I'm not looking at it actually. I think that one's a fruit fly. Isn't that cool? Oh wait, no, wait, here's a fruit fly. Sorry, that last one was a zebra fish. I can't really see Do you want me to turn off the, the brightness? Yeah, you wanna, here, let me show you again. Let me turn off the light here. Maybe that'll help. Hang on a sec. Here, cut that. Okay, let me see. If I can actually look at it. Okay, so yeah, this is a fruit fly. Is it going? No. It's not going here, please. Yeah. <laughs> there. There we go. Okay, so these are the blood cells that we saw before. Uh, well, you can see it better now. If you can see it, will you type something so I know it's okay? Those are flowing inside of a zebrafish. And now we're going to see, there we go. Those are the blood cells inside that zebrafish. You guys see it okay? Okay, and now this is a fish that's developing. So they've taken a baby fish egg and taken a look at it using this fluorescent microscope. Isn't that cool? Anyway, so there's a lot of these. You can just look them up online. You can just um, uh, Google search uh, fluorescent, uh, fluorescent microscopy and that will come up there. Isn't that cool? All right, so you're a kid now and you want to actually do this yourself. How do you make, oh, I can turn the lights back on. How do you make, how do you make a microscope at home? So there's actually a number of different ways you can do this. This is my favorite way of doing it and you hardly need any materials at all. You ready for this? So I'm guessing you have a place in your house where you've got something growing and you might wanna take a look at it, right? Maybe it's something leftovers from three weeks ago you haven't cleaned out of the fridge yet. It could be the bottom of the sink, that drain in the bottom of the sink, or maybe you have a dog and they, they, do, and they have water and they have like a water dish. Usually those are pretty scummy. So any of those is, are great. Make sure you don't use the toilet or anything like that, so anything that's totally unsanitary. But you want to um, take a look at things. You can look at um, bugs from the windowsill. You can look at anything like that. So this is a cool way to do it. You're going to need three things. You're going to need a paper clip. You're going to need a rubber band. See that rubber band? And you're going to need a dollar store laser. Honestly, the, the cheaper the laser, the better these seem to work. You only need these three things. So let me show you. Oh, and a pair of pliers if your paper clip is really stiff, which I think mine is. Can I have a pair of pliers? Okay, you'll meet Al here in just a minute. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is you're going to bend your paper clip. So I used a green one so you could see it easier. The silver ones are kind of hard to see, but silver works great. Okay, so you're just going to take paper clip and you're going to unbend it. And the idea is you're just going to make a small hook on the end. Thank you. Everyone say hi to Al. Hey, everyone. <laughs> this is Al, my husband, and he is like the brains behind supercharged science. He's, he's really great at letting people know I'm doing classes so I can teach somebody. So Isn't yay! Amazing? Isn't amazing? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you're just going to take a pair of pliers or, you know, not your teeth, but something. And you're going to make a loop on the end. And this has to be kind of a small loop. Let me show you after I've got it done. You use a regular paper clip, not a green one? You don't have to use a green one. <laughs> I only used a green one because I thought it would show up better on the screen. Okay, you see it? You see how there's a little tiny loop? Okay. And then, that's pretty much the hardest part of the whole project. You're making a little loop. So, side view, front view. Okay, the loop is here. You're going to take your laser. And you're going to strap this along, and the, eventually what's going to happen is when you push the button, that laser beam, you want it to go through the loop. So make sure you put it on the right end, and rubber band it on. That's all you need to do. Okay, and you want to use a red laser, not a green one. The green one tends to have too much scatter in it, um, and the red one, it needs to be a little bit darker in the room, and let's see, for it to work. Okay, so... The red one has more contrast, which I like. Okay, so here we go. So you've got this, and now when you, you want to use a piece of paper, which I have here. Okay. Okay, 
And so what you'll do, let's see if I can hold everything together, is you're going to shine this on the piece of paper and that's gonna show you how far off you are. See, I'm not quite shining through my loop, so I'm just gonna adjust it and kind of bend it until it really shines through. Okay. And I can do this here on my desk, and now you notice I've got it straight through the loop. Okay. So after you've done that, now it's time to actually get a sample. And so you can be really creative. If you want a really good sample, I'll tell you the best way to do this. Um, so after you mow the lawn, hint, hint, after your kids mow the lawn, <laughs> what you want to do is grab a handful of grass clippings, or you could just go out there and just grab some grass with dirt and everything, and throw it in a jar, like a cleaned out pickle jar, and fill it halfway with water and cap it, and leave it in the sunlight for like two weeks. You will get amazing things in there to look at with stuff like this, so easy. What, what and, if it's all, all frozen? Because and what if it's frozen? Oh, people are saying it's cold. <laughs> well, if your house is... Um, so other places you can go, as I mentioned, the dog dish is a great place. You would just go over there. And here's how you want to do this. You don't want to stick the whole thing in the water. You want a drop of water here. And I will, I'll show you why. It's because we're going to... You remember the water pitcher, how round it was? So we want a big, round drop of water here because it's not going to be a sheet of water it's going to be round what's going to happen is that laser light is going to hit in here and then because of the geometry of that particular drop it's going to spread out you're going to turn down the lights go to the darkest room that you have turn down all the lights it's a great experiment to do at night hint hint when people think like your parents think you're like sleeping you can totally be doing like science um, and so you want to make the whole room really dark and then you project this image on the wall and you will be able to see things swimming inside and it is so cool so what you want to do is you're just gonna I wouldn't use water because there's probably nothing swimming in it well you could check and see especially if your water's been out for a while okay and you're just gonna dip it in and then this is probably not gonna work well because I've got lights on everywhere but Here's the idea, so you can see. Do you see how it starts to spread out the beam? Remember how small it was before? So the further I get, there's gonna be a point where it actually comes into focus. Oh, there is something swimming in there. Look at that. Huh, cool. So um, all you're gonna do, I think I just drank from there. <laughs> so, and then um, obviously the further you go, you can get like four or five, six feet from the wall. And you will be able to see by projection what exactly is in there. So this is a really cool laser microscope that you can make. And let me show you what I just described. Okay. So this is how to make a laser microscope. So this is the laser and it's coming through a single drop of water and it's spreading out the beam. And I used green so I could so it would show up on the picture better, but you want to use red. And so you can see me here. I've got it going through the loop and projecting onto the paper first. And then I projected it on the wall and these are little paramecium that I saw swimming around when I used the water that was, actually I think I mixed the water that was in the bottom of a vase of flowers or something like that. And I was able to project this. And what um, somebody actually, I saw one time on a video, somebody had told me what they did is they projected it and their cat was mesmerized. I mean, the cat was looking at this wall like it was the most interesting thing they had ever seen. They're just like staring at it. And so it was like a great cat toy, I guess. But just watching the paramecia like wiggle and squiggle because they had projected it onto like the side of the dining room uh, wall. So anyway, so is that cool? Okay, yeah, night school. <laughs> Amy, yes, your children can do science night school. That's too funny. <laughs> Again, so if you're, um, I was going to uh, stop and see if there's any questions that have come in. Let me take a quick look. If there's, I'm just going to scroll through and see. I don't see any questions yet, but if you have questions specifically about this, um, I also wanted to give you a really helpful tip. One of the um, top complaints I hear, actually not complaints, but it's like frustrations that parents usually will write in or comment in or something. will say, um, actually there's two top ones. One of them is, um, I, I don't know how to teach science, I, you know, like an art major or music major, or I just don't like science and you're kidding me, right? I have to do this. Um, and the second complaint they get, uh, we usually get is, my kid is so bored with science, what do I do? And so the happy answer to both of these is, um, yes, cats do love science, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Take lessons from cats, no, I'm kidding. Um, so so the, happy, the, the easy, quick 
fix tip, that one of my best tips for this is that you don't have to be an expert and you shouldn't be. Um, you want to surround yourself with passionate people that are excited about what it is your child wants to learn. So if they're really into chemistry, do you have a chemistry professor around who's really excited? Um, or you can choose people online. You know, there's like me. I can teach, um, I do science. If you've got a kid who's totally fascinated with another area, just you want to find somebody who's excited because it's never about the stuff. It's never been about the books or the things that they learn. It's the passionate teachers, the teachers that share their love for doing what they do. And that will help get you out of that situation because you don't have to be an expert. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to have all the answers either. Um, your job is to support your kids and help them ask questions because science is the process of asking questions and getting back answers. And so your job is just to help them ask questions. They make that laser microscope and they're like, doesn't work. And you're like, huh, I wonder why, what happened? And you're like, well, I forgot to put the batteries in. <laughs> okay, well, so your job is to help them get excited about what it is, the world around them. And it's so easy to do because you are an expert at this. You've been alive much longer than they have. And it's easy to look around and say, oh my gosh, did you see what happened? Look at that tree grew this direction. Or did you see what these rocks look like? Isn't that cool? What, what experiments can we do with that? Or this robot, oh my gosh, let's build it. I don't know how to do it, but let's try, figure it out together. Um, so there's, you can surround yourself with people that are totally passionate about what it is your child is excited about. And you can also just um, you're off the hot seat because now you've hooked them up with someone who already has the answers. So your job again as a parent, just support your kids and what they're doing and what their interests are and find somebody, some resources to do that. So if you're really serious about giving your kids a great science education and you really liked what you saw today and you want to take a deeper dive into doing more of biology experiments, especially, um, there's actually this one experiment that usually it's safe for like high school if they get to it at all, but I made a video of it and showed you how to do it with household stuff and you could do it in third grade. And it's so cool. It's how to measure photosynthesis, how to actually measure it with like a clock and a stopwatch and everything. Everything. Um, and it's so cool. All you need is a hole punch and some spinach leaves um, and a light source. So there's there's a lot of easy, fun things you can do that get your kids excited and interested because that comes from, that's part of the training so they will be excited about it long term. So it's not just dry, boring facts that you're trying to cram into their head, but it's something that calls them from the inside out so they naturally want to learn this stuff. And then it's so easy to teach them because they're already interested. Um, let's see, will you have the laser microscope directions posted? This is from Christine. Um, Christine, so here's, uh, here's a way you can get them. It's actually in the free downloads on my website. You can go to www.superchargedscience.com and click on free stuff. And it's one of the first experiments that I actually send you is how to build a laser microscope. Um, and if you can't find it, just email us so we can be sure to get those course materials to you. So simple. Um, and you can also archive, this video will be archived, you can watch it again, and I can just show you step by step how to do it over and over and over as many times as you want me to, <laughs> because you can hit, keep hitting the play and the rewind button. Um, and so, again, for those of you who are just jumped online, my name's Aurora with Supercharged Science. We're building laser microscopes today, and we talked a bit about biology. And if you'd like to take that deeper dive, you want to go to my website, which is at www.superchargedscience.com slash biology and there's a, a whole curriculum program just in biology and it covers uh, those principles that kids need to know before they hit college. Oh, that reminds me, I had a number of people write in yesterday after I shared this and so I thought I would share it one more time in case you missed it. Um, where did it go? Did I throw it? It's here. There we go. So yesterday I was reading a magazine from Forbes, uh, was reading an article from Forbes magazine and it was really interesting because it said that it was talking about what the most in-demand jobs are. I mean, if you think about it, why you send your kids to school, there's probably a lot of reasons. And one of those, I'm hoping, is that they will be able to be prepared for the world that they step into and be able to provide for themselves, contribute and share and grow and learn and all those wonderful things. What was really interesting is that there are, um, out of all the occupations, what is the most in-demand job right now in the United States and what is projected to be even more in-demand because the people that are currently in the workforce in this area are aging and they're going to be retiring and so there's going to be even more jobs available. And it wasn't pre-med, it wasn't business, it wasn't computer science, and it wasn't programming. You know what it was? It was engineering. And the United States has one point here, I wrote it down here, it has 1.6 million engineering jobs that pay between 40 to $90 an hour. That's just an average. 
and there's 1.6 million of those jobs. So what that means is, is that your kids will have an amazing job, they'll have an amazing career, there are lots of them, and there's only, out of all those engineering jobs, there are only four majors that cover two-thirds of all those jobs. So in those four majors, in case you're curious, there's civil, uh, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, that was my personal major, um, uh, electrical and industrial engineering, those four majors cover two-thirds of all those 1.6 million jobs. Amazing, right? So it gives you something to think about. Now, something else that the article also talked about was that an engineering freshman, I don't know if you know this, but at the college level, 60% of the um, students that are coming in as freshmen during their first year in an engineering program will either drop out or they will change majors. 60%, that's like a six zero. That's staggering, that's more than like any other major. So it even went on to talk about why. And the, so the research studies just didn't stop there. They actually found out the top two or three reasons that this was true. Um, and about 40% is dropout and about 20% was switching to another major. And the top two reasons can totally be handled upstream. And so I think what has happened, my, my guess, my best guess as to what happened is that these parents weren't prepared and they didn't really look long term, they just went and took the easier route, and unfortunately, their kids are paying the price. And they're moving back home to be with you! So, <laughs> so what are those two reasons? So reason number one, the top reason was the students did not believe that they could successfully complete the engineering degree program. Well, so what does that mean? That means they didn't have the confidence in themselves, they didn't have the skills they needed, um, the, the values like determination, resilience, um, they didn't have those things built in that said, you know, oh, this is hard. I've got what it takes to make this. So too many that dry was, facts, huh? yeah. What's that? They they were focused on too many dry facts. They were, of learning about yeah. When you get up here, if you're gonna talk, you're I'm gonna sorry. be this disembodied voice. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my husband, Al. Everyone say hi, hey. Al. He is the one with all the degrees in education. So he even understands this on a deeper level than I do. Um, I was kind of just the science geek that went through mechanical engineering. So, um, so yeah, so they didn't have the confidence that they needed built in initially, right? And that's something you could handle when kids are young. What well, you one of the big things in science is um, the confidence comes from doing an experiment or um, researching something and discovering that it didn't work out the way you thought. You're like, oh wow, I learned, I learned that my guess was wrong or I learned it didn't work and I'm going to try again and that's okay. It's okay for things not to work. Um, one of the problems when we just kind of crank out dry facts for kids to memorize and equations for them to, to crank through is they expect to get the answer in the book every time. Answer in the book every time and they don't know how to handle it if they're thrown out into an environment like college where there isn't just a single answer in the book and it's about the process of discovery that you're supposed to be using and they just memorized a whole bunch of stuff and if they don't get the right answer they're like oh my gosh I can't, I can't do this I, I don't know what to do whereas when your kids are focused on exploring the real world especially through doing hands-on discovery and experiments and things like that then when they try something it doesn't work they're like oh wait I know what I'm going to try next and they mm -hmm. keep trying and keep trying and it gives them confidence that they can figure out how things do work in the world around them, in their world, and when they go on to college, it, it gives them the confidence to say, hey, you know what, whether it works or not the first time doesn't matter because I know I got this, I know I can figure it out. Exactly, wow, that was quick. I love it that you shared that, thank you. Yeah. We, we got it on video <laughs> so we can use it again. <laughs> that was yeah. awesome. Wait, wait, get to right here. Right. So, uh, okay, so because you probably know something to say about the second one. Okay. So, the, <laughs> so the second one, okay, so the first one was not believing that they could come, they could complete the program. The second one was they didn't really understand that what an engineer really does. They did, when they got there, they were like, oh, whoa, 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 is this what engineering is and science is? Hang on, my interests are actually over here. So what does that mean? That means that they didn't have enough exposure to science and engineering and technology uh, classes, activities, projects, experiments, programs when they were younger because otherwise they would already know. It's like um, uh, committing to play the tuba and you've never actually played the tuba and you get in there like, whoa, that thing's huge. <laughs> like, There's no way I want to play that. Are you kidding? Give me the flute. So, <laughs> or nothing at all. Maybe you're more into painting, but you don't know until you try it. I mean, what person in their right mind is going to go into an ice cream store and with their eyes closed and say, uh, that one. 
Uh, but a lot of people do that with college, especially when they are picking a major and they have no idea. Do you want to say anything else? Well, yeah. Um, you know, think of it like you're, you're considering buying a new car and you don't test drive it. I mean, that would be crazy, right? You would never buy a car without actually getting in it and test driving it. But, but kids do that with, with uh, college all the time. They pick their college major based on um, just uh, looking at uh, information on um, college, uh, college major overview sheets and web pages and things like that. When really what they should be doing is asking simple questions like, well, if I take this major, what kind of job will that set me up for? And then once they figure that out, which I mean, that's easy to determine, um, then, well, what does someone in that job do every day, nine mm -hmm. to five? What are they actually doing? You know, if I decide, hey, I want to be a, a, an aeronautical engineer, well, you know, what kind of jobs can I get? Oh, okay, so these are five main jobs that aeronautical engineers take. Now, what, is, what does that person do day in and day out. And then if you really, if you want to learn about it the appropriate way, test driving would be meeting those people. It would be, even in high school, taking an internship at a place where aeronautical engineers work and saying, hey, is this interesting? Is this what I want to do? And even though that takes like a little bit of time, I promise you, it is nothing compared to the amount of time, money. energy, money, <laughs> stress that it takes having your kid go away to, to college and you get a frantic call mid-freshman year, I, I hate this, I can't stand it, I can't do anything, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't want to do this. Um, instead, give your child the opportunity to experience what it's really like and start that out. Like one of the things that, that Aurora does um, which is fantastic if we, we've got these intro to engineering Yeah, we created a whole work. series of yeah, just careers. Yeah, why don't careers. we talk about that? Just, um, we had this idea to, to do, I think there's eight or ten of them now. No, actually there's like 13 of careers in science. And so it's a whole course that you can do and you would actually do the stuff that those types of engineers or scientists would really do. And they're in there from, there's geology and astronomy and um, civil engineering and aviation. And so it's a, it's like a a sneak peek that you can do at home so in case you don't I'm like I don't know any pilots right what a word do I go or I don't know a geologist so you can use that and that those would be um, a way that you could really get a real feel for what a scientist in that area does yeah sorry I interrupted you no, no. that's awesome <laughs> okay cool all right well thank you all yeah, thank yeah. you and I just wanted to wrap it up really quick for those of you who are um who would love to see more of this. Oh, and by the way, Al had mentioned, you know, give your kids uh, tools and stuff to get them excited and interested. Um, so you just make a laser microscope. It's like, woohoo, big deal. Well, so the magic here is you give it to your kids and you show them how it works and you say, now go find 10 things to look at and, you know, sketch it in your journal, tell somebody else, share it, share it with three people. Um, let's go to the library and look it up and see what it is that you found because I have no idea. Um, and you get one of those big picture books with pictures in it, you try to match them up, and that's totally fun. Or you get yourself a friend who's into this kind of stuff, who, who is like a life science person or a biology person or something like a biologist, and um, you say, hey, can you help me with this? I took a few pictures of what I saw, what do you think? And, and it's, it's, it snowballs into this whole really cool adventure that they're having in science. Because science is a process of doing, it's not like a laundry list at the end of the day you can go, oh, I went shopping, oh, I made the cake, oh, the kids are uh, tucked in bed, I'm done. So it's not like that. It's science is the process that you go through to, to it helps you become who it is that you'd like to be, pilot, astronomer, engineer. Um, one of the things that I, I did actually, I was lucky when I was 17 uh, and I was a senior in high school, I got asked if I would like to work at NASA one day a week and skip school. So all my 17 year old brain heard was skip school and I said, well sure. <laughs> I was already going to college at the same time because they didn't, my high school didn't have, <clears throat> excuse me, high enough levels of math. And so I was already taking night school and I was already in day school, uh, you know, high school day sc during the day. And then I also had two jobs because I was working to be a foreign exchange student and I had to earn the money for that. And I thought, well, sure, I can handle that. So I started working at NASA. Oh, here he comes. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Overachiever. Don't try this at home. Your brain, <laughs> your brain might explode. I have a boyfriend, but I never saw him. So <laughs> Wasn't me. Wasn't me. So, so, but but the point of this story that I got 
caught up in was that um, I started, um, when I started working at NASA, I was like, I was like, wow, what do you call this? And they said, mechanical engineering. And I was like, oh, this is fun. I love it. Where do I go to school? And they told me where. And I went there. And I went to Cal Poly. And, and so <laughs> it was kind of backwards from what I had done. Um, so I just didn't, I never actually looked at a course catalog for engineering. I just knew I wanted to be like these guys and do what they're doing. And uh, it was awesome. We worked on like airplane, uh, I had a 20G centrifuge that I had to um, I had to help rebuild and I worked on wind tunnels that were so big it fit an entire F-18 into and and they were working on those tilt rotors and we were working aircraft. on uh, uh, aircraft sorry tilt rotor aircraft you know where they they take off um, the propellers are like this um, there's one on either side and they take off and then they tilt them while they're in midair and now they can go forward um, anyway so we we're doing lots of really cool projects and so I was like this is it what do I do so you need long story short you gotta expose your kids to that and hopefully this will give you some ideas on how to do that you know if your kid is really interested in aviation the young eagles program is all across the united states um, and there's there's lots of programs like that every almost every town has an astronomy club and you can look them up and go stargazing and talk to the guys that are in there about their telescopes and so forth so you don't have again you don't have to spend a fortune you just have to get creative about where to look is this helpful? You guys like this kind of thing? Okay, so we're trying to figure out what we should present and share with you so it would be meaningful and you can find real value. So you can always drop me a line at aurora at superchargedscience.com and let me know what you'd like to see. Is there a certain area of science you want me to talk about or show you how to do really cool experiments on? Um, I know there's one in holograms somebody had asked for, so we're going to do that as well. We're going to do a laser experiment in holograms. and. Um, and so also in rocketry, I think that was also requested. So if you have a class you want, you can just let me know what, what it is and we can put it in here. We can also answer your questions as they come by. But a bunch of questions I think already zoomed by, so I'm sorry I didn't see them. Oh, here, I've got um, one. Oh, you've got so, one. Hang on. Al to the rescue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Susanna wants to know what your favorite science experiment is. My favorite science experiment? Right. It's the one that makes kids go like this. <laughs> one that makes kids really excited and science. turns everything they know on their ear. Um, so I have a lot of really cool science experiments that yeah, we've done. Yeah. Um, actually, some of them are up here. There's a, there's a, I think I did a little thing on him. Yeah, we did the tuppy one. We made one. a tuppy one. This is a, a That's robot. That's archived in the Facebook. Oh yeah, it's archived. You guys can look at this one. Work. It's a robot made out of Tupperware and wheels and um, from Lego. Um, that was a fun one. Sure. This is one of my favorites. This one's, oh, the Sterling okay. Engine? Yeah. So, I don't have a mug here, but... Okay, yeah. Okay. So, um, this is actually an engine, um, and Aurora's getting a mug, but you get a, a, a mug full of hot water, and you put it on top of it, and the thing turns, and it cranks around and around using the heat from the hot water. Um, and it's a, a nearly silent engine, um, different from the engine in your car, that needs a muffler and everything to be quiet. Um, it's called a Sterling engine. And we've got a really cool video. Actually, <laughs> he, made one. Um, he made one out of soda cans. He made one out of soda cans and balloons and um, water bottle tops. It is really so cool. cool. Maybe I'll post a okay. little clip on it on, okay. on Facebook. I can do that. Okay. And um, yeah, so there's lots of really cool experiments. There's a four axis laser light okay. show over there. Yeah, oh, battery free really radios awesome have been popular since the 50s. Yep. And um, it's, it's, a radio. it's really yep. easy to do. It doesn't use batteries, only has like three or four parts in it. Um, so that's, that's a cool one. That's a really cool one too. Um, um, we'll have up here. Oh, there's how to measure oh, the speed yeah. of light uses, uh, using a bar of chocolate. It's one of my favorites. Right, that's a cool one. Oh. And the hand boiler, it's glass. Um, has this green liquid in the bottom. I'll put my hand on it and watch what happens. It's going up the tube there. Come on, come on, come on. There it goes. We'll go around and around. And <laughs> it goes into the top. And now watch it, watch it. Wait for it, wait for it. Almost there. And three, two, one. And we'll see who's there warmer. Oh, no. <laughs> the heat from her hand it's um, now heats all down up the bottom. this. And it made, made it go back down to the bottom. Um, here, your hands, My hands are warmer, warm. sweetheart. So you put it on the bottom. Now watch how quickly it goes up with her. Well, I'm excited, and I'm talking about science. Yeah, see, and it just starts bubbling. No magic, no, um, and the chemical, it's, it's um, alcohol with green food dye in it. It's called a, sometimes called a, a hand boiler. Um, 
This is a really cool one, though. Here, cool. There you go. Um, Suzanne is asking, how long can the battery-free radio uh, go? And, um, well, since uh, forever. Forever, since radio <laughs> stations were broadcasting. You yeah. can take one that was built in the 1930s, and it will still be working today. Yep. You can increase the size of the antenna so you can get more, mm -hmm. um, more stations. But anyway. it, it gets its electricity actually from um, radio waves in the air. Mm -hmm. um, it's sensitive enough that there, you know, all around us there are radio waves from radio stations. And it, there's enough energy in those that the right kind of radio like that can actually turn that into sound. And you can hear it and it's powered by the radio waves themselves. Yes. Awesome. Chemistry, yes, of course, we'd love to do chemistry. Chemistry is actually how, one of our number one. How do people do more chemistry? How do people do more chemistry? Oh, so if you want to do lots of really cool chemistry and you want to, you've moved beyond the baking soda and vinegar experiment. By the way, you can heat up the vinegar and add a drop of dish soap. That'll make it interesting. Um, you can uh, check out my website at www.superchargedscience.com slash chemistry. And there is a huge chemistry uh program there that's for homeschoolers and it includes I think 55 or 56 different science experiments you can do. Um, some of it is kitchen chemistry and some of it is also stuff you're going to need to order things from and we found some really great places that have chemicals for like two to four dollars and you can order those and do them right there. You can turn copper pennies into silver and gold. You can do all kinds of really cool experiments and uh, What's that hand warmy? Th oh, the hand warmer thingy is, it looks like magic. Yes, it does. So, all right, well, thank you guys so much. I love being here with you. Let me know what you'd like me to talk about next time. We'll do a couple more classes next week. And we also have a class coming up that's totally free, that's live, um, and it's in robotics. So it's electricity and robotics. And if you sign up for my free stuff on my website where you want to get the free science experiments, you will be on that list that gets that announcement because it's not something we post usually. You can't find it online. Um, it's something we just announce and say, hey, we're going to do a live class in a few days. Here's the date and time. And so um, if you're on our list, then, then you will get those. And it's on um, March 13th. It's a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Is it the 13th it's Wednesday? Next Wednesday? Yeah, it's next Wednesday. We're going to do electricity and robotics. And I'm going to show kids how to make real robots just using the junk that's already around your house. And they will really work. Um, you will need a motor and wires and batteries. And there's a link to order those inexpensively online. The battery packs are like 50 cents or a dollar. Um, you can also take apart old fans um, or old electronic toys and salvage the motors in there and um, that's also an option as well so these are really cool if you want to join but you don't have any materials not a problem you can do the whole class with no materials at all and i will show you how to do that when i see you next week so thank you guys so much i will see you next time bye